a marketing manager there, and I've been here for four and a half years focusing on getting people to rank on Google. So my job every day is getting you on page one of Google. You know what they say about page two of Google? Never seen it. Never seen it. It's where to hide a dead body. <laughs> if you want to hide a dead body, you hide that dead body on page two of Google. My focus here is all the hard work and effort we put into our sites. We take a lot of time working on content, writing content, researching content. And today I'm going to define content in several different ways. So content can be a blog that you're writing. It can be a page that you're writing about your company or about your services. It can be an article or a white paper. On average, how much time do you spend writing one piece of content, maybe one blog? Anybody? Three hours? Anything else? Six, eight sometimes? I know generally when I write a good, well-researched blog, and Google likes blogs that are more than 1,000 words, so if we have a good, well-researched blog, more than 1,000 words, it could take me six, eight hours to write. Some of my clients are CPAs. I'm not a CPA. <laughs> I don't know about actuary and accounting and all these type of things, but I research it, and I write it just like the client would. So I might spend eight hours researching and writing a blog. And then what do we do after we write a blog? Everybody. You write a blog, what do you do with it next? Post it. Post it, and then what? Post it on social, then what? Forget about it. That is the correct answer. Forget about it. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today, is we spend all this time writing this great solid content, either for our own website or for a client's website or to help out a friend or family member, and then we forget about it. We post it, we tweet about it once or twice, and you never see it again. You never hear about it again. So we really want to focus on repurposing the same content in a new and a fresh way. Anyone ever heard of this guy, Barry Ganner, Vanderchuk? I can't even say his name. So anyways, he's very well known in the digital marketing field. And he had an article a couple of years ago about how to repurpose content. His content started as a video. He then took that same content, turned it into a blog, took that same exact content, turned it into yet another video. And then he turned it into a blog on medium.com. And then people on medium.com shared that blog no longer on Gary's website, on somebody else's website. Every time he repurposed it as a video on YouTube, it got more shares, more engagement. Same content he was doing in many different forms. So when we spend all this time creating great content, we want to make sure we're not just forgetting about it, we want to reuse it. And there's a couple of tips and tricks within WordPress itself that can help us with this. And I want to kind of talk about when we're writing content. So the way I see it, there's three types of content that anybody writes. Evergreen content, timely content, fluff content. How many of you have written fluff content? I just have to write a blog. They require me to post something once a week. So I'm putting in fluff content. There might be some other words for it, but basically it's content that it's really good for now. It's maybe 500 words. It's maybe not really well researched but the client required me to post a blog. It might not be the best. So I have a client who's a dentist. How many of you go to the dentist? How many of you have ever been on your dentist's website? <laughs> Very few people. How many of you have ever read your dentist's blog? Nobody, yeah. So I have some dentist clients and we do write blogs for that client because it does help them get some traction. We're able to build some links to it. We're able to share some social media to it. Who's ever gone to the Facebook page for their dentist? A couple of people actually have. But generally, if you're talking with a dentist, I call them fluff blogs because they want blogs on their website. Blogs are important for their website. Very few people are actually going to go to their dentist website to read a blog, unless it's about a specific service. So if you want to get Invisalign braces, then you might go and read more about the Invisalign service. If you want to have sedation dentistry, you might read about that and try to understand what is sedation dentistry, what can they offer to me then they're going to read that blog. I call that content evergreen content. That content is relevant to people for a year or two or three years. The general principles of how to brush your teeth and floss have not changed a lot over the years. 
So a blog that you write about how to floss well might be evergreen content for a dentist website. If it's something for a CPA website, a lot of the laws in accounting change, and the IRS changes rules all the time. So what you write for 2017 tax year is not going to probably be relevant for 2018 tax year. Also, there's seasonality blogs. So if you're writing about how Halloween candy can ruin your teeth or all the candy we're eating here can ruin your teeth, because that's what a lot of dentists write about, how much you're going to ruin your teeth by having any sort of fun, that's not good content. That's seasonal content. That's not good evergreen content. So the concepts I'm presenting here are evergreen content. And this is good, well-researched, well-thought-about content somebody else might want to actually read. Because, I mean, you admit it, some of us have written content nobody's going to read. I mean, several people are going to read it. The client's going to read it. They're going to be happy with it. But truly, you're not going to have a huge spike in traffic over a blog about how Halloween candy is going to ruin your mouth. Nobody wants to read that. That's just sad and depressing. Other than parents telling death to their children, perhaps. Maybe that's an angle. You also want to look at your content in terms of who is your target market now? Who's your target market five years from now? So right now, you might be targeting the Raleigh area. You might be targeting downtown Raleigh for your evergreen content. But down the road, you might be interested in offering services to Greensboro, opening a new office. So making sure that your evergreen content is also not limiting your services or your service area and recognizing where you want to be focused on. So we want to go ahead and write a big core of evergreen content. So this is really important. Everyone kind of get what I mean by the evergreen content? Yep. How many of you have written really good evergreen content for a website, a magazine, a blog in the last three months? Only a couple of folks here. Yeah, and then how many of you have written some fluff content? Yeah. <laughs> so we got to kind of think about is when we're writing our content, how are we spending our time? Are we putting the effort into the ones that we really want to last very long? So I have one piece of evergreen content on my yoga website that I work on. So I work for a small yoga uh, studio in Smithfield, North Carolina. Anyone ever heard of Smithfield, North Carolina? Only a couple of people, yeah. So they actually are getting traffic from India from LA because of this great evergreen content I wrote for their website about the top 10 qualities of a great yoga teacher. They're getting so much traffic that will never ever go to Smithfield, North Carolina. But they are getting traffic and it's a good evergreen blog that really helps them bring in traffic and also helps with new people checking out their studio. They understand and they respect, hey, these guys are doing a really good job. They're explaining stuff to us. Let's, if we're in Smithfield, let's go check them out. So the first section of stuff I want to kind of cover for tips for using this content is WordPress plugins. The first one is Yarp. Yep, another related post plugin. Who here has used Yarp? What this plugin does, and most of the plugins that I'm covering here are free, and some of them do have upgraded features that you can pay for, but the bulk of them are usually a free plugin that you can use anywhere on your WordPress. So with Yarp at the bottom of any page or any post, you can set and add other related posts by tags, by keywords, and it'll automatically fill this in. So by having the, this information, a blog from two or three years ago, can be included in relation to a blog that you post today or tomorrow. So this is one way to make sure the old content you've written, the good, solid, evergreen content you spent the time with, is reused. Yarp. Another one is republish old posts. And so this one will actually take that old post, and you can actually define how long it means old post. So you can actually take an old post, and it will republish the old post. It does not create duplicate content. So this is one thing I've been asked about this plugin before. It doesn't create duplicate content. It takes that old post from two years ago, reposts it with today's date. So it actually changes the date for the old post. And the comments will come over with it as well. So all it's doing is really changing the date on the post. But people going to your website will see it up at the top again in your blog category. And you can define how many days you want to use this for. So I don't recommend like a 30 or 60 or 90 day. I recommend going out further, 120, 365, 730 days. You can really use some older content in here. Again, define which content you would like for this. And then also, <clears throat> You can omit categories from republishing. 
So at some point, one of the categories you might have on your website is seasonal stuff. So therefore, I do not want to republish seasonal stuff or fluff stuff. You don't want to call it that on the back end of your website. But have some sort of way that you can indicate to yourself, I'm not republishing any of that content. I'm only republishing the content that I really want to share that's good and evergreen. So let's republish old posts. Custom 404 pages. Who here has got a custom 404 page on their site? This is a great way to link people to new content or old content. So in the case of Last.fm, what they've done is they have a very basic looking 404 page, and that's fine. But they've actually gone through and included some information about, OK, well, here's some other things you might have been looking for. So this might be a way for you to include some of your old, evergreen, solid posts. Oh, so you didn't find your answer. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this? You can also feed in on your 404 page a list of your most recent posts or posts by categories. So you can actually customize your 404 page. Questions? Does that make sense? Next, scripts. Anyone ever used this guy before? All right, so not a whole lot of people have heard of this guy. So next, scripts actually takes your posts and pushes them out to all sorts of social media for you. So this is all the other posts have been relating it back into your own website. This ties into all your social media. Next scripts will allow you to take an old poster, uh, blog, or whatever content you have and share it throughout social media. And it has a whole lot of features on it. It has even more than this screen shows. So it'll automatically share it to Blogger, to Facebook, Google+, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Tumblr, Twitter, and there's still even some more. So at some point, you have to set the settings on here, and it will automatically post old posts out to these platforms for you. And then you just have to do a little bit of description on defining how you want your description to be on these guys. But this will actually take care of retweeting that out for you, posting it on Facebook again, posting it on LinkedIn again. As long as you're OK and trust the bot to work correctly. One thing is, anytime you have a bot doing some of this work for you, always double check your social and make sure it's posting it correctly, and do some spot checks here and there. Um, some of these plugins do have ad settings. Make sure to shut off your ad settings, because sometimes your ads are not appropriate for your content. So we've had this with a client before. So like, it's something is, if you're not aware of what your ad settings are, they might conflict with what the client is saying. So if you're a CPA website, there's often ads for bail bondsmen. That might conflict with CPA stuff, with finances, because they're like, got in trouble for spending too much money, and then you're on a CPA website. So that doesn't tie together very well. And then the same thing for if you're on a lawyer website. You don't want any bail bonds ads on your lawyer website. That's kind of a conflict of interest. So at some point, be very careful of these settings in here, what ads you're allowing, because they can automatically populate those in for you. But in the settings for next scripts, it can help you push all this stuff out. So my own personal Twitter, I very seldom tweet. I'm tweeting today at the conference, but I very seldom tweet. This is all done with tools like this for me. <clears throat> so I'm actually taking several other people's websites. They're scheduled out through a program called Buffer, which I'll talk about later. And they're going out the door for me. And so people are constantly following me, liking the stuff. I have no idea what they even what it even is. I'm monitoring it here and there to make sure it's still on target. I have a very specific message when I'm saying on my Twitter. But I'm not doing all those posts. It's doing it for me automatically. I have certain times of the day I've set. Posts are going to go out those times. There might be one going out right now. I don't know. <laughs> it does all the work for me, and it uses old content. <coughs> so this is a great way to get your content repurposed and out there again. Any questions along this line? OK. People need more candy because it. I can tell everybody's getting kind of that tired later in the day. Yeah. Shareaholic. Anyone using Shareaholic? Yeah, Shareaholic allows the same concept as the another related post plugin. There's several ways to use Shareaholic. One is including at the bottom of the page. You may also like so related posts that people might be interested in. And this is something, again, these guys have ads, so be careful a bit when you're using your Shareaholic to make sure their ads are turned off or you're aware of what their ads are. <coughs> By default, it is turned on. You want to just make sure you turn that setting off. And then Shareaholic also makes it very easy for you to share, have people share stuff on their Facebook and their Twitter and all that type of stuff. And there's some great settings on that one as well. <coughs> 
sharing onto other websites. So this is really the magic of sharing. A lot of the stuff has been sharing on your personal social, your personal website. But really, the power of making, new, of making content evergreen, well-researched content is getting it on somebody else's website. How many of you have he heard of HuffPo, Huffington Post? How many of you are published on Huffington Post? Nobody. How about Medium? Quora? Yeah. So you can write this great content for your website and submit it to websites like these guys and then get your content published on one of these guys. These big content aggregators allow guest posting. If you're strong, well-researched content, you put it on your website first, you slightly rewrite it so you don't get any Google duplicate content, and then you submit it to one or all <laughs> of these guys with your fresh idea and submit it and see if they'll publish you. So this is something one of my um, coworkers did recently. So he did some research. He's a PPC expert. He did some research on PPC for our own website and wrote a, wrote a great blog post for our own website. He sent it off to jeffbullis.com. He's, he's pretty well known in social media circles and PPC. And Jeff was interested. He said, hey, I have three ideas for you. So my coworker proposed three ideas. <coughs> Jeff accepted one of them, which just happened to be a blog he had already written. So all he did was slightly retweak that blog. He already wrote for our own website, and now he's going to be on Jeff Bullis's website. And Jeff tweets all the time, and he's really good about retweeting his old content. So now Greg not only has a link on our The Design website, he's going to have a link on Jeff Bullis's website. Every time Jeff promotes Greg's post, The Design, my company, will retweet that, helping to grow it. So at some point, that, that article is going to include a link back to my company's website. So people who would have never heard about my company will find out about the company via this other website. So this is the key of using somebody like Quora or Medium as well. You can write great, solid content that you've already done the research for, put it up on one of these sites, and they will promote it for you. They will go on social media for you. They'll promote it. People already know and trust and respect these websites. And then there's a link back to your website. The more you can post, the more they'll get to know you, the more they'll get to know your company, and you're building authority. Also, you're building links to your website, which is great for SEO purposes as well. Search Engine Journal is another great one. If you've got some great topics, a handful of the topics that are covered in the business track today would be great on Search Engine Journal. You just need to submit your idea to them and go ahead and see if they like it. And submit several ideas. Don't expect every idea to be picked up every time. Make sure you've got really solid, well-researched writing. And you can go ahead and submit to them. And then another way to repurpose your content is take it off your website. It's no longer a blog. It's no longer a piece of written content. Take that exact same content that you did and post it up on SlideShare. So all you need to do is take your ideas, Create a bunch of PowerPoint slides with your ideas. Maybe each of your H2, each of your headers in your blog article becomes a PowerPoint slide. The longer, the better on SlideShare. So this is not intuitive to the way we prefer presentations. Generally, a three-hour presentation will fall asleep. <coughs> but a SlideShare that is 30 slides or longer will get more traffic, more engagement. So take your long, well-researched article Break it down, each of your pieces, into snippets. It literally can be paragraphs. It doesn't have to be a pretty PowerPoint. Put it up on SlideShare. So SlideShare is attached to LinkedIn. So you can share your SlideShare onto LinkedIn, onto Facebook, onto Twitter, onto everybody else. And you're sharing the same content across. One, re one content, reusing it in a different way. Who here has made a video out of a PowerPoint? So I literally have a PowerPoint literally in front of you guys. I am getting a video made right now in front of you guys. So that's already two pieces of content I have off this one talk that I did. At some point, somebody is probably tweeting about me right now. That's more content that I have off of this one talk that I am doing. So take this slide share that I created for this talk 
make my own short video of it. The video can simply be my slides scrolling by slowly with a little free licensed music <coughs> in the background. Or it could be me talking through some of the points. But again, same concept, same ideas from my talk, and I'm repurposing in it yet another way. So SlideShare attaches to LinkedIn. LinkedIn gives you an area to attach content. And so in your LinkedIn area to attach content, I actually put my slide shares in there to tie them together because they played together very nicely. And I can have links. So I'm creating links to my LinkedIn, which creates links to my company website, which links back to my SlideShare. Make sense? Reusing, reusing. So YouTube and Vimeo, again, the same content. And maybe some of your content, you actually take a little bit of a snippet of something else. So here's um, a pest control company. So they've used the same concepts that they wrote in a blog. They have somebody talking and basically reading the blog out loud. And they are talking about honeybees. So they just had a, a little video of honeybees while the guy's talking. So creating another version of the exact same content. Podcasting, anybody doing podcasting? OK, one or two? Same thing. Same content and create it into a podcast. And interview other people. One thing that's great about podcasting, a lot of people in the podcast community, they're looking for something to talk about. If you know a podcaster, somebody who does one, quite often they're looking for somebody to talk to. A number of people who have a podcast is just them sitting alone in a the room. They want somebody to inter interact with. Let them interview you. You can read some of the same concepts, re talk through some of the same concepts you've already researched in a podcast, either of your own or somebody else's podcast. And then, especially if you have your own podcast, if you can cross promote somebody else's podcast, you guys can kind of share ideas. Find out who out there has a podcast, because a lot of people with podcasts are desperate for content. And they're happy to promote you on their podcast. Turn your talk, your concept, your thoughts into an infographic. Any idea of what tools are great for making infographics? Anyone here make infographics? What tools do you use? Canva, yep. Anyone? Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. There's a lot of great things um, that have, there's a bunch of templates out there. There are some already outlined in PowerPoint. I think you can just literally Google infographic templates for PowerPoint. There's a bunch of great infographic templates. And a lot of this is the same concepts. This might be the same research that was already done in somebody's blog, turning it into an infographic. And that infographic can be another piece of content or blog on your website separate from the original content. So at some point, <clears throat> this could be a very long article that's on a website. And it's the same information that's already in the website on another blog. You link it back and forth. Where's a great place to put infographics online? Pinterest. Pinterest kills for infographics. And so this is something a lot of people are not aware of. <clears throat> Using Pinterest as one of the social media tools, a lot of people don't naturally use Pinterest. But it's actually a wonderful tool. And let me tell you why. So when you tweet, how long does a tweet last? How quickly does a tweet go by on your Twitter? Seconds. The half-life of a tweet, so the amount of time half of the people ever saw a tweet is 30 minutes. A tweet is basically half the people will ever engage with a tweet in 30 minutes. A Facebook post, one day. Instagram, three days. Pinterest, two and a half months. Two and a half months, 30 minutes. So the amount of time that you could create a tweet or a Facebook post, if you make a Pinterest account, it'll stay out there on Pinterest and still get engagement a lot longer. Because Pinterest is not time sensitive. This is the key and the goal of Pinterest. Using it as a marketing tool, it's not time sensitive. Unless you write a Christmas post, unless you have a wedding post. If you're posting about weddings, it's going to spike again in May through June. And then if it's Christmas, it's going to spike every single year. So at some point, create an infographic and then make sure you're sharing it on your social media, all the platforms again. These infographics can also be turned into a video. You can have a really boring video with just the infographic, maybe a couple introductory slides, somebody talking through the infographic. You put that on YouTube, you put that on Vimeo. 
Then you share that link to the YouTube, you share that link to the Vimeo on your Facebook, on your Twitter, on your Google+, on your LinkedIn, on everybody else. Newsletters, same exact content. Take your blog, take your content that you've written before and put it in your newsletter. We often do our newsletters and we talk about the most recent content. Get something in there from two years old and put it in every single newsletter if you're doing a newsletter. A number of times people are desperate for newsletter content. Nobody wants to write a newsletter. Nobody has time to write one. Take some of your old evergreen content that's still relevant or present a question about it. So pull something that was really trendy in 2016. Talk about something, talk about the Pokemon Go craze a while back and say, where's Pokemon Go now? And just leave that open for people to think about. So somebody might have written an article about that a while back because it was really hot and everybody wanted to catch that trend. And so at some point you can post about it as, have you even heard anybody mentioning it lately? So at some point reusing your old content again in your newsletters gives you more traffic to the old content and helps people get deeper into your website, get more engagement, help grow your website. And then talks. <laughs> so reusing your same content that you've researched, literally give a talk like I do, using the same talk. So at some point from a previous talk that I've given here at WordCamp Raleigh, I wrote, um, I wrote a book, an ebook. I made it into PowerPoints. I already had a video done. They recorded it for me. And then I cut that video up and made it into shorter video snippets. I made a couple of GIFs out of those video snippets and it went all over social media. The same content, literally. Just repurposing and reusing the same content. Everybody with me? Yeah. Social media tools. So the next thing I want to kind of cover is trip, tips and tricks for saving you time doing this work. The whole goal here is you take the time to write great content. We want to make sure you're engaging and using that content over and over again. Who here sort of if this then that? IFTTT. So it's IFTTT.com. And this is actually a lifesaver and a time saver in many, 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 many ways. So at some point, this will connect most major platforms with most other major platforms. At some point, <coughs> you can set this whenever you post on Instagram to automatically tweet that same Instagram at the same time. Or you can set it whenever you post on Instagram to send that same Instagram post into Buffer. Buffer is a scheduling tool that lets you hold and buffer some of your posts so it doesn't go at the exact same time. This is the way I do my personal Twitter. I do it through if this then that. I grab a feed from social media today and I feed it through if this and that into my buffer. And then it queues up in buffer sometimes 10 days later after the post came out and it tweets it out. The second social media today post a blog, they automatically tweet it themselves, which everybody should be doing. So that's great and that's easy to do with a plugin or two. So at some point, I don't want to post the exact same times they post because it seems like that's what I'm doing. So I put it into a buffer and it holds for a couple of days and then it gets sent out. By the time I send my version out, it was three days ago on Twitter, which might as well be three years in Twitter terms. So it was so long ago on Twitter, nobody even remembers them talking about it three days ago on Twitter. Then I put my post out there, tagging social media today, tag and using whatever hashtags are relevant, and then re-engage. And I'm getting a bunch of engagement on this. They don't realize this is what I'm doing. So I'm using this tool to go from a feed, which is one of the options on here, to buffer. And then I'm scheduling my buffer to go to my Twitter. You can go from Facebook to Instagram, Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Facebook to Instagram to Google+, to Pinterest, to Tumblr, to your blog, to your WordPress, to your Slack. So you can tie most major softwares that are really popular today. You can actually tie it together, a free tool. It takes about five minutes to set something up. They're called applets. And these little applets tie things together. Basically, if you want, when this happens, do this. So if this, then that is literally what it puts together. So at some point, a number of my clients I manage, they have five or six social media profiles. I don't want to spend time doing Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, 
and Google Plus for all my clients individually every single day. That takes up a lot of time, and that's all I'm going to be doing for them, and that might not be the best use of their time. So by using a tool like this, when I spend my time writing a great Facebook post, it'll schedule in and go out to Twitter within a couple of days. So I keep their Twitter full of information that I've written. It's not automated. It's just automated copying to another place because a lot of people worry about, I don't want to send it on all platforms at the same time because then it looks like that's what you're doing. But by using this tool, it lets you hold it a little bit and then send it out a little bit later. Another thing you can actually do with this tool, a lot of things it integrates with um, Amazon Alexa, it integrates with Google Home, it can integrate <laughs> with most smartwatches these days. It can integrate with your phone. It can set when you arrive at a location, such as when you get to church on Sunday and the geolocation on your phone picks up you're in church, it will actually mute your phone automatically for you so you don't, you don't forget to mute your phone in church. It has a lot of power, so this is a great tool for integrating and sharing your content and sending, saving yourself some time on social media. But this allows you to use not only your content, but anybody else's. This allows you to do a delayed retweet. Sometimes I want to retweet something somebody said, but they just said it, so it's not really, I want to wait a little bit. I use this tool to help me wait a little bit. Um, also, I use a lot of Hootsuite. Who here uses Hootsuite or Buffer? This is similar. Mm -hmm. Free tools, and they, they have some paid upgrades as well. But at some point, when you post a post, you wrote a great post, you post it on your website, how often should you post it on your social media? Throw out some numbers. Once? Four times a week? Yeah. Eight times a week, 20 million times a week. It doesn't matter. If it's Twitter, it's gone in 30 minutes. So as far as Twitter goes, literally one post on your website, you can post on Twitter 10 times in a week, and no one will know as long as you schedule it different times. Because people who are on Twitter at 2 a.m. are different people than who are on Twitter at 2 p.m. If they're not on it both times, they will not see that that's what you're doing. If you do this with a lot of content and you space it out. So basically, when I do a post, <coughs> I schedule it at least 15 times in Hootsuite on Twitter over a two-month span. Because at some point, and you could even do five-month span. At some point, you just need to click the buttons. But one, in, one post should always be carried forward. You should never just let it die on your website as soon as you post it. So using this tool lets you schedule out in the future. And you can schedule it out on LinkedIn, on Facebook, all that type of stuff, and schedule it out more often. For Instagram, you can't really do the scheduling out. It's, it's harder to do, but also they will recognize, hey, it's the same picture again. But it works really well, especially on Twitter. On Facebook, if you're active on Facebook, you can do this. If you only have one post a week, you don't want to have it always be the same thing. But especially for Twitter, you can tweet as many times as you want. Nobody's even going to notice. So you want to make sure you're reusing your content. Any questions, any comments? Anyone else need more candy? Because I'm feeling a deadness in the room. <laughs> Yes, there's a setting you have to do for that. Um, so it's specifically when you copy it over from Instagram or whatever, it will, you can set copy over the image or it'll give you a link. There's different options in there, yeah. Could you use IF number of Yes, yep. So at some point is I, um, sometimes I just use IFTTT, it doesn't have a limit. So I have probably 30 of them I manage. So at some point, I use them over Hootsuite sometimes, depending on, what, on what, I, what I'm using it for. Yeah. Sometimes I use TweetDeck to schedule my Twitter and let IFTTT take it off of TweetDeck. And don't even bother with Hootsuite if I'm only focusing on Twitter for a client. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is um, check your advertising settings. Check your settings. There's a setting on there to not allow other people's posts. Yep, exactly. And, and it depends on what you're trying to do. Sometimes you want external posts, and you can limit that. But generally, I, I recommend keeping it just to be your own posts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do 
Um, no, it's basically, it, it's not, it's because it's still the same post in the end, it just has a new date. It doesn't make a difference to Google. It's also not duplicate content, so it doesn't hurt you with Google. It's more for a user experience thing and for just getting the content back out there again. Yeah. Any other comments or questions about content or social media in general? We've got a bit of time still. And kind of any other questions about general social media I can field? As long as it's at least, I think it's 75% unique. So if it's the same thing, and if it's on your own website, it's less of a concern. So the duplicate content is really more of a concern if it's somebody else's website. So if you're taking content off of Huffington Post, claiming it as your own without a canonical URL, which is, some, which is a way to say, hey, this is Huffington Post's content, you will, Google will penalize it, and they will be like, nah, no thank you. But at some point, if it's on your own website, as long as most of it's original, you're good. It's, it's, and, and again, if there's 25%, you're using the same paragraph, <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. But usually within your own site, you want to have it be kind of fresh, but it's more of a concern if you're using somebody else's content and not giving them any credit for it. Yeah. Yeah, so the goal is to get engagement on your posts. So at some point, whether it's, there, it's you're posting on social media, they're engaging with their social media, then they're learning about your brand, whether it's even if they're not even going to your website and they're learning about your brand on social media, brand awareness. And they find you in a different way. So at some point, it's really about taking the time, you're taking the time to write great content. Why are we only using it once? We really want to be reusing it. Um, and at some point, it's also it's something is, it saves us time. If we've done a great job, why are we only doing blog posts? We often seem to just be in the mindset of, let's just do a blog post for the website. We want to do, there's so much more that you can do with the same concepts. Probably, probably check with the law firm and check with like what your agency agreement is. Okay. Um, in the case of most of our clients, we ghostwrite as the client, and so therefore we could not, could not claim it as our own. Yeah. But it depends on your relationship with them. Okay. So at some point, is you might be able to reference snippets of this, right. of like saying, "Hey, I wrote this," and you can maybe do a paragraph here and there of like this blog, this blog, this blog. And I would just double check with them about what's your agreement. Um, and that's just one thing is just make sure, especially law firms, yeah. making sure you're, you're careful with that. But you can, or if nothing else, <coughs> if it's like for your own personal portfolio, you can say it with their permission, I wrote this for them with like a link to it or something like that. But I would double check how they feel about it first. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Yeah, and that's where I said define the evergreen content. So figure out what content is really the best ones to do. And then generally, I like to put a tag or a category for them in my WordPress for the blogs. And that way, when you do these plugins, such as the yet another related posts, um, you can actually tag or the republish old posts, say, I, only want, I don't want this category. I want this category. So but decide. And that's kind of step one of really using this is, Go back through your old stuff and see what you actually want to share and find what is your good evergreen content. Stuff that's actually, or it might be need to be strengthened. So it's something is, it's like, hey, this is a great blog that I wrote three years ago. It might be still relevant now if I add one more paragraph on or, or just change it up a little bit. Because a lot of times we're looking for sources of new content. We've got all this old content we've already done on the website. And so sometimes you can also readdress the same content is talk about, Here's what we said three years ago. Here's what we say now. Link to that old, old article three years ago. Even take some snippets of the old article from three years ago. So a handful of things in, in marketing and in development change, and some of them never change. 
Customer's always right. That's never changed. We still have to put up with them, but. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? All right, and I will be in the happiness bar afterwards. We've got a little bit of time before the next session, but I'm going to be over in the happiness bar, which is over near registration if anybody has additional questions. Again, I've got some swag in here. Um, I've got my business cards if you have any questions. I've got some candy to wake folks up. And then we do have a prize. <clears throat> and this is Theo, Theo Wapu. So I work with V Design, so Theo Theo Wapu. Um, so my Theo Wapu shirt goes to the person who can tell me what the half-life of Pinterest is. First hand, two and a half months. There we go. You are the proud owner of a Theo Wapu shirt. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for coming out. I really appreciate it.